Welcome, welcome. So, um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, this is our third day of our summit. Uh, it's our public event. Um, this time we are also focused on uh, our uh, shift our focus to uh, China EU uh, attention, uh, China EU relationship. That's the uh, main purpose we gathering today. So um, today is a public event. Um, so we are invite and open up, invite some media um, to come in and also join us online. So there's some uh, around 40 international media uh, got to register and they probably watch the live stream uh, today. So first, I want to introduce our host today. Uh, it's uh, Andrew Small from the GMF. He's a senior senior transatlantic fellow uh, for. Asia program of the um, German Marshall Fund of the United States. He's also helped establish the uh, Asia program. His new book is Rapture, um, China and the Global Race for the Future. He's an expert for the China, U US and the China EU relationship. Um, and also he will introduce our honor guest, Andrew. Okay, working, yes it is. Um, Okay, well, welcome uh, everyone, and, and thanks uh, TTCAP for, for the introduction. Um, and just to say, I mean, on behalf of, of GMF, we have been uh, really delighted to be associated with, with this conference. We helped a little bit on, on the margins, but it's been uh, a fantastic uh, job that um, uh, DoubleThink have done, and we've been um, uh, really very happy to see so many of you, you, you here in, in Berlin. Um, for this discussion on China and Europe, uh, China and Germany, uh, we couldn't be happier to have uh, the person who's sitting um, with me here today. Um, uh, Frank Muller-Rosentritt um, is uh, uh, going to be a, a fantastic um, interlocutor to be able to make sense of all the complexities of uh, the German debate on China uh, right now. Um, he has a particularly interesting uh, vantage point on this, um, uh, not only from uh, his party, one of the members of the, of the coalition government, his vantage point on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, his vantage point uh, as the um, w with responsibility specifically for China and, and Asia um, uh, for the party, um, but also he was involved in the coalition negotiations, um, uh, the, the, the complex process on the foreign policy side of reaching reconciliation between uh, three parties with, with quite Quite different views on 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 these issues. Um, this is one of the the issues that I, I hope to kind of uh, push on to, to to help make sense of what's going on with that. Um, uh, he's the member of the um, German Bundestag for, for Saxony. Um, uh, welcome. Um, delighted you were able to join us uh, this morning. Um, I'd like to begin by seeing if you can just give a bit of context um, for people who are, who are sitting watching the the German. China debate from a distance, who watch Chancellor Schultz's visit. Um, I think it can be difficult to make sense of how far the debates here have really moved in Germany on China in, in recent years. Um, I wonder if if you can kind of explain that to, 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 to the group here and, and, and watching online. Um, it feels like it's been quite a significant transition um, in, in the last period, even if not always reflected as fully in uh, policy yet, which we'll get into. But um, I wonder if you can just kind of give a bit of context for how the debates here on, on China have really developed. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. I I heard you had a uh, a nice party uh, today evening, so uh, I totally can accept that not everybody is uh, st still here uh, yet, uh, because uh, I know a lot of conferences. Uh, uh, international conferences, and I know that it, it's not that easy to wake up in the morning, especially if you if you had a big party, and party is also very important. So uh, let me let me let me start uh, with uh, with your question. You, I think, not I think I see, and I hope you see it too, that um, China view in Germany changed massively in the last in the last years especially especially in the, uh, since we have the new coalition um, the coalition is not every time that easy you know um, but when it comes to um, foreign policy especially when it comes to um, uh, dictatorships when it comes to communist regimes and um, then 
we did a, a very big transformation you mentioned already. So if you if you see if you come back to the 16 years of Angela Merkel, our former chancellor, you have to recognize that um, Angela Merkel have uh, feel very feel very well with uh, dictatorships. So you you see how often they uh, she was in Russia, how often she uh, was personally together with Putin, how often she was in China, and you see I I. I picked the picture. I picked the figures out. Uh, Angela Merkel was 13 times, 13 times in China, and only three times in India, and uh, more or less in Japan. And the last um, official member of a government um, has been in uh, Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, was Michael Klos. Michael Klos, <laughs> everybody is a little bit longer on the political knows how, how many years this, this, this is ago Michael Klos uh, was a Minister of Economic Affairs. So I think it's 20, uh, 16 years. Eight. So, and this is, um, and this is uh, I think, this is the few, if it comes to um, the old government, that uh, we let our democratic partners in the world, especially in Asia alone. Because if you see, I'm very often the region there. And the most asked question to me is, where's Germany and where's Europe? And they said, and I, and I say, okay, because this, that's what we're going to change. We, we changed it now, that we have to blow up um, diplomatic firework in the democratic countries in Asia, because they have to learn that there is an advantage if you become a democracy. If you go, if you go on track to become a democracy, you have to have an advantage. Uh, and the advantage is, for example, you are very, you, you are very close to Germany. You are very close. Uh, your government can be very close to the EU. And but well, what what is what they recognize in the in the, in the past? They see, okay, I can be on the track to democracy. I can be have a, I can have a very diverse um, parliament like Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And what is the result? Nobody cares about me. They go to the dictatorships, to, to the communist regime, to China, and so. And we want to change it, and we change it. And I, you said, you mentioned already, I was part of the, um, uh, I was part of the team who um, had the, of the co coalition. Um, Verhandlung. Um, yes, yes, of the coalition negotiation process, and we, uh, and we, and we changed it, and it, it was the first official document in Germany from a government who criticized China, and we, as the first official document, we write down two sentences about Taiwan. So and we called it democratic Taiwan in an official document of the Federal Republic of Germany, and this is a huge change. So then the question is, um, in a sense, the, the coalition negotiations came out with with some, as you say, quite strong language. Um, there's been the feeling of this kind of shift underway. Um, then we see this recent visit um, from Chancellor Schultz. We see the decisions on Hamburg port. Uh, we see, I mean, I sit and read the foreign affairs uh, piece by the Chancellor the other day. Um, and we hear some quite different kind of countervailing debates um, around what the Russian invasion of Ukraine means for China policy. There's one version that, for instance, says we must not make the same mistakes again. We must not repeat the dependencies on China. And there's another view that you hear that says, um, well, you know, we have so much to deal with at the same time. Uh, we have this war. We have an economic crisis. The economy is fragile. We can't take on the China issue. We have to be extremely cautious. We have to go slowly. Don't rock the boat. Um, you see the opinion pieces from uh, a lot of the German CEOs. Um, how do you see this moving at the moment? I mean, how far... If, if I was to look at that coalition document and I was to then look at the... Uh, the, the foreign affairs piece by, by Chancellor Schultz, I don't see that fully reflected in, in the document. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. 
analysis is right. Because we are three partners in the coalition. And I think when it comes to China and Russia, the party is um, fast away from our position, from the Korean and from the liberal position, is the Social Democrat Party. So, um, so you have to, you have to <laughs> not you have not to recognize, but you have you have to see, and then you see it, they are um, not that much agree with all points we uh, wrote down uh, in, the, in the first in the first stage of the coalition uh, contract. So, and now the councillor, of course, councillor uh, Scholz is a social democrat, and of course, <laughs> he personally uh, has the chance to uh, bring his own behavior in this, and this own behavior can uh, can be a little bit uh, another than uh, the coalition um, contract. And so, I criticized very, very hard and openly in the press everywhere that the deal with Hamburger Hafen is uh, it's it's bullshit because otherwise we could never, never a German company would be never allowed to do the same in Shanghai or in, in Shenzhen, never. And we do it uh, like, like like on former times. So this is, a, I think it was, a, it was and it is a very big mistake. So um, when it comes to our um, chip industry and so much more, we have to be, uh, we have to be, we have to have very open eyes to see everything. And you have to have a China experience, but not, ex but, but not a China experience the Confucius Institute give us in Germany, but the China Institute Barracks and you, for example, give us, uh, to Germany, give us. And so we, that's not that easy. So um, the trip to China from our Chancellor Scholz, yes, I criticize it too, but you have also to recognize it was the last P5 country he visited. And for, and for a councillor of such a big country like Germany, um, you, this is a very strong diplom diplomatic sign. And I work f in the Committee for Foreign Affairs, so diplom diplomatic is our, our, our DNA, of course. And, and you see, he visit every country first, Japan, all other P5, and the last P5 is China. Angela Merkel did it exactly in the wrong other way. They visit first, okay, maybe France, and the second, and, and the second is not Japan or or Delhi, or then the second is China, for example. And so he changed also his behavior. And if you see now the strategy in the foreign affairs, the China, uh, the new China strategy, you see how. Um, strong, the or how how strong this 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 swift uh, in our behavior uh, when it comes to China is. So I wondered if you could then talk um, on on that since 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 you raised the the China strategy. Um, there is due to be a, a, a new and and kind of really the first official public China strategy released by Germany next year. Um, in some way in. Uh, conjunction with the national security strategy, depending on the timing. Uh, you've seen the draft. Um, uh, you, you're aware of at least, and, and it leaked. I, I think for anyone who's, who's watching, so, some of the material has been um, in, in, in the press um, in Germany as well. What I mean, this is then supposed to be where these debates in one way come together. The, the draft that's there is from the foreign ministry. Um, uh, what do you expect to be the key points that really emerge from, from this? And, and, and what, are you, what, what do you see and what do you like and what are you concerned about um, in the strategy that, that's, that's there so far, the draft? Yes, unfortunately, right now it's a secret document, <laughs> so you, so unfortunately, you cannot talk about a document nobody knows. <laughs> so, uh, but um, yes, of course, we have the chance as a parliamentarian to go in a secret room with a special code to see to to, to see them no no <laughs> no cell phone, and you can only read. And after that, you have to keep it there. And yes, so um, because it's a first draft, and. But I can promise you, I like the draft. And because it's the first time 
the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs did really deeply think about our relationship when it comes to China. And in comparison to the, our former uh, government, there's not only um, a dimension of partnership in the, in the relationship, there is also a big uh, dimension of rival. There's a big dimension, a big dimension ship of uh, how we deal with autocratic states, and how, in a very big dimension, also uh, to um, dependencies. And we are not that far like Japan. They have their own ministry for econ for economic securities, so they look very clearly where are our uh, dependencies. Um, where are our dependencies on raw materials, um, where are our energy dependencies, and, and so, and they see, and we in, in Germany, we wrote it down in the, in the coalition um, contract term, but <laughs> we have to first write down to, um, to, analyze, to analyze our dependencies, where, are, where we have dependencies. We are, right now we are totally blind. So we see not where we have the dependencies now. Okay, the first uh, uh, research is started, and then we can uh, then we can identify something. If, for example, gallium. We 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 uh, we import nearly one hundred percent from our gallium from China, and gallium is the most important uh, raw material for uh, gallium. Uh, Gallium silicium uh, wafers. So for the new, uh, for the for the five G and all for all of the, the modern chips, and we produce this gallium uh, gallium silic uh, uh, gallium arsenide gallium arsenide wafer uh, gallium arsenide wafer. We produce them in Sex in Saxony in Germany, and forty percent of all gallium arsenide wafers all over the world came from Germany from Saxony, and if we have no gallium. There are no chips, and and we have a mine. We have a gallium mine in Germany, uh, a, a gallium mine in Germany in North Germany, and uh, five six years ago we closed this mine. And now, I ask the government whether we can reopen it because then we are independent. It's very easy, but then we have a lot of issues and challenges with climate with climate issues and can we do this or not? And so we have to rebalance. Uh, what is in something more important to become more independent to climate to climate action and so this is a this is a it's not that easy but I think in some special things we have to focus more on how we can become how we can become how we can we become independent than the last meter of climate action. So, I mean, one of the critiques, um, of course, is that whatever the policies are that are decided, some of the major companies just decide to do their own thing um, uh, anyway and are still having a kind of heavy hand on um, on, on influencing the, 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 the decisions on, on some of the big questions, uh, including on this dependencies issue. Um, there was a report from one German institute, um, uh, I think earlier this year, talking about the fact that, at least for some companies, they were not reducing dependency at all. They were deepening it. I think it was called full speed in the wrong direction, um, uh, talking about. Um, and, and we're now, it's clearly, it feels like there's been a move from this much wider cluster of companies um, deepening their involvement to a smaller subset. Um, certainly, we, we, you know, we have BASF, we have Siemens, we have um, uh, Volkswagen. We, we have a few of the key companies now who are involved in this. But um, we've seen even the proposals from the economics ministry to suggest at least not providing government support, at least not providing certain guarantees, at least slowing this down, at least kind of not deepening this, but we, we still see the companies kind of pushing ahead with, with that. I, I wondered if you could kind of comment on that. And we, we've seen their public defenses of this in, 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 in opinion pieces um, in, in the German press as well, and, and it reflects the context that we're in, that they are having to make the case in this way, and, and you certainly hear that some of them feel on the back foot on on this and we've seen the debates move 
at the BDI and 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 you know in wider German industry. But I wondered if you could comment on how the key companies here, which clearly do represent a large part of of German industry, are seeing these issues are relating to the, what feels like. The change in the wider consensus on dependencies and the economic relationship with China, or how far they're just going to kind of dig in and resist, and we're going to see the same um, results in another couple of years as, as as we're seeing at the moment. Yes, a, this is a very big question, and the answer is not that easy. But um, I can say, as a liberal guy, of course. I'm not a um, fan uh, from regulation from the government. So I, s I think the most important thing is that the entrepreneurs, the business guys can do their own decision without the government say no, 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 no. So because this is a miracle of a free market. But if the market works, and I'm pretty sure it works, we see and I was on the Asia Pacific conference three weeks ago in Singapore, and there were more than 600 CEOs from our small and medium sized companies from Germany in Singapore to speak about how we deal with China. And this analysis, give in this moment, um, is analysis is right if it comes to the big companies like BASF and so and but and you see we have right now more than 200 billion euro um, trade between two countries so this is a after after the US the second largest trading partner of Germany so you cannot decoupling it um, stupidly no that it's not possible. And I think decoupling is also not the right way. But, and now I come back to the market, of course, the CEOs of our companies have to look what does this amazing big China exposure in their balance sheet means. How big are the risks in the balance sheets? And there is one example. I've spoken with a um, with a very high-ranked uh, manage, manager from Deutsche Bank, and I worked also for Deutsche Bank for more than fifteen years. So I have also the the banking the, the bankers' view on the balance sheet. And now the companies, especially in Eastern Germany, in my constituency where, where I am from, they a lot of companies because the history the, the history with the Soviet Union. The companies are very successful. The, the companies were very successful. They were very successful because they have a very big exposure with Russia. So this is a, a niche where they are, where they, where, where they operate. And now, of course, it's because the sanction, because the war, they lost a lot, a lot of revenues. And now, this this companies looks with a completely another view in their balance sheet and and look, okay, I have uh, dependencies from China, my balance sheet from, maybe, uh, from, uh, from, from Russia, maybe 40%. And now I look how, man, how many revenues I do with China. Okay, 50%, 40%, 30%. And then they ask, and if the CEO not ask, I'm pretty sure and sometimes the bank will ask the question, what will happen? What will happen if, I hope not, China is doing some crazy thing with Taiwan. And the world is, or the world has to give the same sanction to China like now in Russia. What is going, how is the, how is the, the, uh, the impact of your of your balance sheet how is the impact of your revenues and then and then in this moment the CEO wake up and they say wow it's, I never thought about this but you are totally right if this if China becomes the same sanction like Russia I'm bankrupt 
I cannot do my business. And so we have to diversify our markets. We have to diversify our supply chains. And this is the debate we have now in the, in, in the, in the small and medium-sized uh, companies. And yes, and I was in Singapore at the Asian Pacific, Asian Pacific Conference. And the most important thing was how we can diversify our supply chains, how we can uh, diversify our production lines, uh, Is it, the, is it the best solution to build the, the second or the third um, fab in Shanghai or should we do the first, uh, the first fab after China also in India, Malaysia or, or in Vietnam or in also? And this is and, and, this, the, the, and those questions everybody was asking in these three days and for the region, for the ASEAN states, all for, they're all crazy states in the ASEAN states, but we have a lot of very, very uh, beautiful and uh, good uh, government states there. And we have, to, and the next question is, when we decide China plus X, for example, so we have China, but we have to diversify, then we have to think the next step, where we have to go. Is it Vietnam, is it it's India, is it Malaysia? It's, and, it is, and we have to strengthen our relationship definitely with Japan. And this was a very good thing of Olaf Scholz, that he, the first trip was to Japan. And this was, uh, we have the, um, the government consultation bilateral with Japan and Berlin. And so it's very important. And if you, if you, see in, if you come to Japan, I was four weeks ago, I was in Tokyo. <laughs> and you see this is also... If you see on the on the, on the uh, globe, you see in the north they have the neighbor Russia, in the east and the west they have the uh, the neighbor China, and in the south they have the neighbor North Korea. So they have the same challenges like Germany, but very close, much more closer than we have it in Germany. And so we can much more learn from Japan and from Taiwan. And we have to be there. We have to be in Taiwan. We have to be in, in Japan. We have to be in South Korea to learn how they handle uh, their relationship with China and how they um, secure their ec ec economy, ec economy. Um, so I'd like to open this up in, in, in a second if people can kind of think about uh, questions in the room. But one more question jumping off from uh, the one of the points you were making about your exchange um, on Taiwan. Um, I wondered if you might just say a word about both dimensions on the relationship with Taiwan. Firstly, the question of is it possible um, to do deterrence better with China on Taiwan than we were able to do with Russia on Ukraine. Um, we ended up, the sanctions you talked about with Russia, we ended up surprising ourselves by how strong they were. Um, but then that meant that Russia was uh, expecting them to come in. And China was certainly expecting them to come in at a lower level, central banking sanctions and some of these things. Um, is that something where we are able to send a different message to, to China now as a result? Um, are we doing an effective job of communicating that um, to Uh, to, to China right now. Um, but, I mean, the relationship with Taiwan, of course, should not just be defined by war and some of these contingencies um, it, in the, um, as you mentioned, in the in the um, coalition agreement um, and, you know, widely in the government, it feels like there is more space now um, for the relationship with, with Taiwan to be upgraded in different ways. Um, I wonder if you might say a word on, on, on how you're seeing that, that moving as well. Yes. I think the war in Ukraine changed everything. So, and all, not, not, um, Herrn Mützenich. Uh, Herr Mützenich is, a, is, the, is, the, is the leader of the party, uh, the Social Democratic Party group. Uh, he, his Zeitenwende takes a little bit tight. So, <laughs> he needs more time for his Zeitenwende. So, and, um, because, uh, yes, but, um, the majority in the parliament, but very far right and very far left. They're stupid in, when it comes to Russia and when it comes to China. But um, the center parties, center left, center right, all center parties, um, changed their view after the war rapidly. And because they see that the people, researchers, scientific guys, say, okay, it can to be, it can to be true can be happened. So war is not it's uh, uh, it's not unimpossible. 
and we see it, and we have the intelligence service, we saw it, but nobody listened to it. And even if the even if even if the even if the uh, intelligence service open his information to the press, we didn't believe it. As I believe it, but a lot of people said no. And so and then they see what's going on. And now we have a completely another debate when it comes to China and Taiwan, because now they see what's going on there. And okay, I a, have a very special relationship to Taiwan. I'm very engaged in, or, or in information. And if we see right now in Taiwan that we have not only ships but in the street of Taiwan, that we the first time of history have the Chinese, uh, Mar the, the Chinese Navy also in the Pacific, in the in the uh, in, in in East Taiwan, then we see that things change. But and this is also uh, true. China, I think, did not expect how strong we as democracies are. Because one of the most, yes, one tactic of the communist regime is to divide democracies. They used our weakness of the system that we have a pluralistic system, that we have a vibrant debate. And of course, in debate, everybody can say what you what you want. And for a communist regime, it looks like we are not one opinion. Of course, we're not one opinion, because we debate, debate, re-debate, and, uh, and debate, and re-debate. And, uh, and they think, OK, this uh, it's not that what uh, my understanding, how I uh, lead a um, state. Because I have no debate, I say one direction. Everybody is follow me, and so they thought they can use uh, they they can um, they can use our um, weakness of democracies. But now he's, he's now he was I think Xi Jinping was totally surprised uh, how strong we can together if it comes to special times, and. So not only the it's it's not only Europe and the US it's the global I think the global West it's also Australia it's Taiwan it's Malaysia it's Japan it's South Korea and the price the price for um, inviting Taiwan or is getting so high because our closeness together in our democracy the teaching being said. Maybe he can think about no. Maybe it's not the best idea to take Taiwan because I could not. I could not survive it. And you see it also in the way how China now deal with Russia. Um, I think Putin thought he could plant the amount of weapons from China because they want they have them, and they did. They did not. We have. We have. We have no. Uh, um, knowledge about any uh, weapon delivery from uh, from China uh, to, uh, to to Russia, because <laughs> they see how 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 uh, how high is the price, and so I think it's change, and I would love that we change uh, our behavior to Taiwan, that we have uh, we, we can we can uh, have the officers from Taiwan here in Germany uh, in our um, in our army to to teach. We can have much more. Uh, um, exchange, youth exchange, much more exchange also with the parliamentarians, and so we have to we have to do much more together. Um, and we, because as Germany, we can so many so much from Taiwan because if you maybe you know um, Audrey Tang. Do you know Audrey Tang? Is of course yes. And and if <laughs> and when I met Audrey in Taiwan, and she was also here in Germany, and I see how they deal with fake news, for example, and how we deal with fake news. It's a, it's a, com it's a completely another way. And we can s learn so much from Taiwan how we can deal with, uh, with these communist regimes because they have the same dependencies, much higher than Germany, uh, but they have a they have a plan they have a they have a and so we have to support Taiwan and uh, say and say in every in every uh, speech we have and but the first thing is we have to recognize how strong and how crazy the communist regime is and that the regime in China is um, if we have to we have to understand it and I think we didn't understand it in the past uh, how the communist regime um, managed the world. Thanks very much. Any questions um, from? Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, so after the invasion of Ukraine, uh, there was discussion that was being reported in the, in the English language news about Germany increasing its defense spending and starting to rethink its, um, its defense uh, strategy, which was previously quite reliant on the United States. So, um, but then I, I remember noticing some news about how that had been sort of the original conception of what, how Germany would change had been uh, reversed in some way. But I'm wondering in, in this much more, I think, um, competitive international environment, whether Germany uh, will think about engaging with the world uh, you, on a sort of political and military uh, level, um, and whether you have thoughts about the realities of that or whether it will continue to be sort of more focused in this economic way about how it relates to countries in Asia and other places. Any others to gather? Yes, just over here. Thank you. Um, you spoke very convincingly about the um, uh, failure to understand how the communist regime in Beijing really functions, but don't you think there's a broader picture and there's a legacy of misunderstanding in, in Western Europe about, uh, you know, the legacy of the Soviet Union and the communist regimes in general. And there's a debate which was studiously avoided in Western capitals about what are the lessons which were uh, not fully learned from the collapse of the communist regime in Eastern Europe. Uh, and that debate, I mean, it's high time to have it, actually, because we see the consequences today. So it's not just China but it's uh, communists in general, how they really were and how they were reshaped after 89 in the form of nationalist imperialist regimes. And this is true for Beijing as well. Okay, two big questions to, to finish with. And can I just add a very small one, which is on 5G. Um, part, the Bundestag, I mean, the decisions were reached that seemed to set a direction on, on um, Huawei's role in 5G networks here. Right now, the build-out in Berlin alone is 100% Huawei in the radio access network. And the companies have just kind of gone ahead with um, making their decisions on, on, on this. Uh, regardless, I think it's above 50% for the build-out in Germany as a whole. Is the Bundestag going to... Uh, I mean, this is with the government now for the implementation, but um, how cons much concern is there in, in terms of uh, the direction that was, was set on this and, and then what's actually happening in practice? And then if you can wrap up, the, the, this, this will be your kind of closing thoughts to, to answer these two, two big questions as well. Okay, I start with this question, I then I, I let over to all two. I was, okay, it's, I was together with Norbert Röttgen, but at first I, it was me. We criticized uh, to implement who or why in our German critical infrastructure. We did the first hearing in the German Bundestag um, to criticize Huawei. And this was in 2018. And everybody around me, also from our, because Liberal Party, we are a very pro-economic um, party, come to me and said, Frank, are you crazy? You cannot, how can you criticize China? How can you criticize Huawei? We have to do business with, with this. With this. Um, you, I vote you for, I vote the Liberal Party uh, to become much more business and then you criticize our biggest business partner. That's not, that's not the reason I, I, I voted for you. So, and that was a very big, uh, yes, a debate, not, not a debate, it was, it was not easy for me and also for our party guru, but we often, we every time say yes, but liberal, it means liberal to be independent, uh, and independent he's, is also to live in a democracy, um, acknowledge um, human human rights and freedom of speech and everything and we have to care about all over the world for this uh, for, for this uh, values and this is the most important thing because if you have no values all over all because the communist regime takes over partners from us like Russia Ukraine or maybe the Baltic states or um, China and the south uh, closed uh, uh, sub Chinese sea then 
your business is nothing worth. So we have to care about uh, our values. Okay, then they think about it and they're like, yes, you are right. And then we have the first hearing of Huawei. Huawei. And, and the government, former government party, CDU, and also in this time the Social Democrats, was, was not that easy to convince that it's the wrong way. So, because that we had no idea about critical, critical infrastructure, so and this was um, for me unbelievable how legislators um, are totally were, were, and sometimes they are, but they were totally blind when it comes to critical infrastructure, totally blind. And you see our hacking, our how many um, atta hacking attacks we have uh, every week from th from these uh, countries. You have to wake up, and so um, for me, this decision from the, from Berlin is absolutely unacceptable, and that's it's not the correct way because I, I have three daughters, and I do not want uh, that they grow up in, in a in a world when they maybe they will become turned to twenty years or twenty five, and then somebody is sitting uh, like Xi Jinping on the wheel and uh, throw down the light or say, okay, you, are, you drive too fast with your car, I have to, I have to shut up. So, or what, you, what you don't go, you, you want to wake up in the morning, I make a little bit loud music for you. And, and so, or the production, oh, the production of BMW is too fast, I have to reduce the production line. And, and, this, and this is not the way I want to live, I want to do it by myself, decide by myself. So that's the first, I, com I completely, I, or I could never more agree with you when it comes to um, to um, Huawei, so how we deal with the Soviet this, this Soviet Union or the, the communist regime? I'm also totally with you that a lot some parties in Germany learned didn't learn anything. They learned nothing. So and you see, I cannot be. Too open because it's a secret. The when it comes to the coalition, how we built the coalition contract, how we, this negotiation process. This was a very, very tough process because you have our parties on the table. They say, "Okay, we cannot criticize China. We cannot criticize Russia, and we have to accept their interests, of course." So and this and this is what we uh, have to bring together. And we said no, we have to criticize them because it belongs to us and to our to our partners, and. If you read all the books from Mareike Olberg, for example, or you, or, or you papers, you, and you have to learn how deep the communist regime goes into the individual freedom. There is no individual freedom. And if you see the Communist Party of China has now, I think, 95 million um, members. So they are in every angel in the world. Every, they are everywhere. And so... And they have a plan. They have a, they have a plan how they um, want to stop influencing from the Western uh, from the Western world. And if it if you now listen to Xi Jinping and the and all maybe in most of his speeches, when it comes to when he speech when you have, when you talk to his own party, uh, then his he always says that. Um, you as communist party members have to learn from the servant, from the collapse of the communist regime in uh, from, the, from the Soviet Union and his main topic he mentioned every time is was it, what, what, what was a big for him the biggest mistake the communist party did in in the Soviet Union was they they opened they opened her mind they uh, let they had a debate about the uh, about the, the the right way and he said we can and then western influencers came in the soviet union and um yes and influenced the debate and this was the this was the beginning of the collapse of the common of, of the soviet union because they are not st strong together with one opinion and so china does everything, everything to um, 
that nobody inside in his system, nobody in the, in the no uh, no open media, because they want to control what they want, what they said, because he want to learn from the and we, as the Western world, except in the U.S. and maybe in our say, I think we did not acknowledge. Uh, what they do, and and we you see that that we are now here in Germany that we th that we have a very open speech in the Asian Pacific Conference in Singapore. Um, I think we changed our behavior because we learned much more about the system, especially after the world. The, the mindset changed completely. And to you, uh, to the NATO, to, to the to our um, change in the military, I think we didn't take our responsibility for our military we sh in the way we should i'm i'm also an officer of reserve i'm a captain of the of the air force and i see how bad was our air force so and like for a country like germany we have we we have to have a, a very modern uh, army, navy, and air force, of course. Because now we see that the freedom, the, f the freedom world has to be much better prepared by military than the unfreedom world. Not because we want to have a war with the unfreedom world, but we want to secure our freedom world. That nobody will become an idea to attack us. I was on Monday, uh, Tuesday, I was on the NATO headquarter in Brussels. And it was, we have a lot of debates about China and NATO and so on. This is also a movement. NATO talk about China. Do you, can, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you remember when NATO talk about China in the, the past years? No. So and that's a, this, is, this is a changing process. And so now we know we have to have partners in the world, modern weapons, we have to spend money, we have to spend the money not for war, we have to spend the money for all our partners that the communist regimes in the world, the dictatorships in the world knows very clear if I attack if the freedom world, I have no chance to win. And this is the reason you have to spend money, like an insurance. The two percent we have to spend as from, from our GDP uh, to our military, to our military. This is, I call it, the insurance for freedom. And we have to spend this money. And all our left parties say, "Okay, you spend it uh, because you want to have to war your military guys." And so, no, this we spend it that we have. We spend it that <laughs> that we want that, that we spend it the money for stuff that hopefully we will never use. But if you do not spend the money, I'm pretty sure we has to use and then we are not prepared. This is true. the freedom must be prepared much more better than the unfreedom world. And that's a great note to, to finish with. Um, uh, thanks uh, so much for ranging so widely across all of these the, these topics. Um, and uh, yeah, if everyone can, can, can give a hand. <laughs> Thank you.